Good evening. Can I get everybody to come down? Let's come to the front like we asked the students in the classroom so we can get good questions and good answers. I can barely tell the students from the employers, which means that they did a really good job with their dressing this, this, this night. This is good. I like this. So my name is Antoinette Livingston. I am the director of the Center for Career and Professional Development. And can you hear me? Good, so I'll be on my best behavior. If you couldn't hear me, I could be on my worst behavior, but you can hear me. So um, we have assembled you tonight for a couple of different reasons, but the biggest reason is, as some of you may know, that prior to now, we were called Career Services. We become the Center for Career and Professional Development for one reason and one reason only. And that's because we want to make sure that the professional, career and professional development of our students is first and foremost. Is our goal, or my goal, that when we bring freshmen into this university, that we begin on day one, explaining to them what career and professional development looks like. And then after telling them what it looks like, we want to move them through the process. So when you meet a freshman as our partners, right? And we don't want people here who are not our partners. Um, we, we want partnerships. We want people who are in this with us who have the same mission that we have. And I know that you're here to be partners because I've only been here since January, but I've seen some of you more than twice. And that's a very good thing. Um, but we want you working with our students. We want you talking to our students. I want my students to know you. When they see you, I want my students to say, oh, that's Jewel, let me go speak to her. And I don't want there to be any fear. I don't want there to be any trepidation. I want them to feel like I can sit at the table with Latoya. I want them to feel like that because once they get to that place, we can send them out to interviews and we don't have to worry so much about them being nervous. We don't have to worry about them forgetting. We don't have to worry about them getting lost in the mix. So that career and professional development, it'll also extend to some micro internships and eventually into internships. But that's kind of what we want to see for our students. Tonight is a really good night for our students to hear about our panelists, where they came from, how they got to where they are. That's important to hear that process. Some students don't know the process because a lot of us didn't come from households where that process existed. They, our parents didn't go to college, right? So they can't give us that information. This is a part of what we want in this process. So from those panelists, also, what is work like? What is it like to leave Gremlin or to leave Ruston and become CIA or become Weaver or become Secret Service, right? Louisiana Department of Health. What is that like? What does that feel like? What does it look like? How do I get there? We believe by starting these conversations at freshman year, by senior year, they're more ready. So we have a great panel for you tonight. We're gonna start with Ms. Gramlin, Ms. Madison Johnson. Come on up, Maddie. I like this right here. I like that. I, I, I like I like the let me help her up the steps, right? Because we know that there is pedigree there. Now I'm gonna sit and let you have the honor of hearing from Madison and she's gonna bring our panelists up. You good with that? Yes. Good deal, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am Madison Johnson. 
Johnson, a senior mass communications major here at Grambling State University. I am from Dallas, Texas, and I humbly serve as the 70th Miss Grambling State University, and I'm so elated to be here tonight and welcome you all to the candid conversations about careers and opportunities. I'd like to welcome our representatives to the stage right now. Um, Jennifer Brooms with Weaver, Dr. Quintrella Cahey with Central Intelligence Agency, Annette Douglas with Intergy, and Tony Magaro with Southwest Research Institute. Thank you for joining us today, and the goal for today is to provide firsthand insight into career and professional development processes. So for my first question, it's for everyone. Can you give me a brief description on your organization and your role and responsibilities? And we can start with you. Of course. My name is Jennifer Brooms. I am a senior manager in a risk advisory group at Weaver. Weaver is a public accounting firm. And as all public accounting firms, you know, focus on tax and audit, I work in more of our consulting group. And so that gives me that opportunity to have more of a connection with my clients. I'm not really focused necessarily on financial statements, but I am focused on their operation. I am focused on their controls, and I am focused on how I can make their organization better. I have another question for you and everyone else too, but what was the first day of work at your organization like? For me, when I got to Weber, it was actually part of an acquisition. And so I was with a boutique firm that did internal audits for financial institutions. And that owner decided that he was going to close the business. But he wanted a place for his employees to go, not be out of work. And he found Weaver. He liked their culture. And he felt like it was consistent. And it was with our culture as well. And so we merged there. And the first day was just learning them, learning their culture seeing how we fit into that firm. The next question is the same one. Can you give us a brief description of your organization, your role and responsibilities, and just tell us what the first day was like? OK, so um, Quintrella Kehi with the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, we are, first I'll say, we're not a law enforcement organization. We gather foreign intelligence, do analysis, and provide it to the policymaker. And our, our highest customer is the President of the United States. Um, how do we gather our intelligence? The office, where I currently serve as Deputy Director, we do open source um, collection and exploitation. And what that means is we look at foreign media. So whether that is um, traditional media, print, press, radio, and also social media. So. We use that information, we make it available to our collection side of the house, our collectors, which some people call our spies or our agents, but our um, directorate of operations, help them so that they can gather intelligence through their means, human collection, and to our analysis so they can make, um, they can put together analytic products and make them available to the policymakers and to the president so then they can make decisions based on national security. Um, my first day with the organization, you are making me go way back. <laughs> I started with the CIA in 1991 um, while I was here at Gramlin as a student. Um, I was a student intern there. So it was um, first time actually living outside of Louisiana. So it was just taken in awe of being in the DC metropolitan area and being in an organization such as CIA was very overwhelming. But I will say the CIA made it very easy for a transition because I was a part of a, student, a lot of students who had come from across the country to be a part of the organization. So we formed this bond. We're friends to this day. We're godmothers to each other's children. So it was a really great transition because it allowed me, I would say that's the place where I actually grew up. So Gramlin gave me an amazing foundation and then everything was up from there. Um, currently, I serve as deputy director, as I said, of open source exploitation, where I'm responsible for leading a global organization where we do foreign media um, collection and exploitation. Thank you. Grambling definitely does prepare us for the future. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes ma'am. Uh, my next question is the same for Ms. Douglas. Give, you, give us a brief description of your organization, your role, responsibilities, and the first day. 
Um, so I work with Intergy. Intergy is a, um, it's basically a power inter, um, energy organization. We um, work very closely with um, nuclear. I work with a nuclear um, plant. I am an HRBP um, senior generalist at Intergy, the nuclear plant in that, it's near Baton Rouge, St. Francisville, Louisiana. Uh, we work with a lot of the community in seeking, you know, uh, rates and how we can best um, provide, um, you know, the rates and, and how we can source energy to them in um, more of a satisfactory um, way. Uh, with my role at Intergy, I do a lot of in employee relations. Um, with employee relations, I seek succession planning, how we can develop our employees through um, their goals and seeking pipelines to develop our employees and progress them within their roles, one um, engineer one to in in engineer two or what have you. Um, seeking training plans and, and how we can source um, the best and quality plans to move them and progress them in a role to move up where they where they desire. Um, my first day at Intergy um, was very interesting. It was I came from a lot of corporate uh, industries, and so working in a nuclear environment was very new to me. It was definitely. Um, a position of learning and getting to know all the leaders within the organization, understanding what they do. So sitting down with the individual leaders and understanding um, how the nuclear plant works, how um, power generation, the different business units, and then um, as well as going to corporate and understanding those roles within, um, within corporate. Um, it's just, uh, it was, it was definitely, like I said, um, an experience working with uh, nuclear and understanding how, you know, that nukes are transferred and, um, you know, how we, we have outages. Outages occur every two years. So understanding that process and, and knowing how we, uh, how we remove the nukes and where we, where we place them when we do remove them and who handles that and who manages those pieces. Um, getting to know the employees, trade and craft, and really understanding their roles and how important they are to our communities and energy as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. My next question, um, last but certainly not least, is for Mr. Magara. I'm saying that correctly. Can you give us a brief description of your organization, the role and responsibilities in your first day? I'm part of Southwest Research Institute. It's a independent, nonprofit R&D organization that was established back in 1947 on a cattle ranch on the west side of San Antonio, Texas. We actually work on things in all the STEM fields. So if you think of the rockets that fly to the moon, well, we still have instrumentation that's flying past, or that actually flew past Pluto, and is in a Kuiper belt sending information back to, the, back to Earth. But we also work in the deep sea where we design uh, modules for scientists to go explore the deepest parts of the ocean. Uh, we have an automotive group that, that works on advanced engine concepts. Uh, we have individuals that are doing applied research in, in autonomous vehicles. So we span the technical breadth of the STEM fields, and we've been in existence now for 76 years as a nonprofit. R&D. Now, my first day, I actually started as a student when I was going to a very small college in San Antonio, St. Mary's University, about the same size as Grambling, uh, and we, they were looking for students to assist in the study of automobile safety. And at the time, Southwest Research Institute was actually developing or helping the Department of Transportation develop the standards for the vehicles that we drive today. 
the airbags, the seat belts, how the side door rail beams work in the vehicle, rollover characteristics. I was a biology major, so I assisted in ensuring that the occupant kinematics, the, the movement of an occupant in the vehicle uh, was, was done so in a manner that minimized any type of injury causation. That was my job. It was a phenomenal start to a great organization. The key is that I moved from an R&D work into my current position in human resources through continued development. Uh, that's one thing that, that, that we certainly ask every one of our employees to do is continually develop yourself professionally, be it through your education, uh, be it through your certifications, your associations and professional organizations. I was able to do so, and now today I'm the Vice President of Human Resources at, seven, at a Southwest Research Institute, a 3,000 employee organization. Thank you. So you said in college you were a biology major? I'm sorry? You said in college you were a biology major? Do we, do we have college majors? No, for, in college you were a biology major? I was a biology major. How did you go from biology to human resources? Well, I did exactly what we suggest our own employees to do, and that is to, I completed a degree in human resources completed my master's degree, completed certifications in compensation in uh, Society of Professional um, Human Resource Management uh, staff. So I completed the certification and I became a recruiter. And from a recruiter, I was able to move into other fields of HR. Thank you. My next question is for Dr. Kahey. In college, we spend significant time studying the technical nature of our chosen careers. As an accomplished professional, what advice would Dr. Quinn give Quinn, the undergraduate student? Uh, it's interesting because I'm hearing them talk about HR and I actually started my career in HR. And so I did that for about 15 years and then ventured out to, to other things. But actually my degree is in accounting um, and it was, I wanted to be a psychologist, but I didn't want to go to graduate school. Imagine that. And <laughs> ended up going to graduate school anyway. Um, and so I decided to change my major to accounting, and I have never worked in accounting. Um, so if I were, and I think at that time, actually at that time, this was in the late 80s, it was, you get a degree in accounting, you make a lot of money. And so that's, that's all I was thinking about was making a lot of money. And I didn't realize, I think I, re I do remember sitting on the sofa in my apartment in Reston, graduation night in tears, looking at my degree because I hated accounting. And so if I were to have a conversation with myself, uh, if I could talk to that 18 year old who was entering Grambling, I would say be true to who I am. And really not focus on the money, but focus on what do I want to do with the rest of my life and how do I follow my purpose. I think that, that would definitely be the thing. That would be one thing. The other thing is, is having come from Louisiana, I had not broadened myself, I didn't know much about what the world had available to me, was to open, open the aperture of my thinking on what's available, what's the possibility, be agile, be flexible, be open. And I think I learned, that's one of the things I did learn through my employment with CIA, um, understanding that coming from Lake Charles, that was not my world. That was, only, that was only a part of it. But now being exposed to much more, I wish I would have done that a lot sooner. And then the, the last thing, which I think is critically important, particularly as I look at world issues, is um, having been learning, I would far more competent in one foreign language. Mm -hmm. I took French because I had to take a, take a foreign language, but I wish that I would have kept with it and would have become fluent in, in foreign language because in, in our line of business, foreign language is extreme, having a competency in foreign language is extremely important in our, in our line of work and it makes our people much more competitive and the opportunities are much broader. So I would say um, being true to who I am, being flexible, agile, nimble, um, being open to the world and new opportunities and if I could learn, have learned a foreign language fluently, I would have done that.
Okay, I'm gonna start studying my Spanish again. <laughs> Do yes. that, definitely. You're from Lake Charles? I am from Lake uh, Charles. My family is from there. Really? Yes. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have any advice on internships or what you should do in college in order to be successful in the future? Sure. Um, speaking of talking, speaking to my younger self, I did not seek um, an internship until the year before my senior year, which was actually too late. Mm -hmm. You know, I thank God for the opportunities that was placed, and I believe that all things happen for a reason, and life life falls in place if you're open to it. Um, but I remember um, I was going into my senior year and I thought, you know, my parents probably would think it's a great idea if I had a job when I graduated. And so I remember uh, it was Lonnie B. Smith, who was head of career services and was like in this little house. And, and I went there and I interviewed with CIA. I had no idea what CIA was. Knew the letters, that is about as much as I knew. And I remember talking to this amazing guy from CIA who talked to me about the opportunities. And, and I'm listening. I'm just thinking, I need a job. And immediately he asked me if I wanted to come up for an internship. I thought, not knowing what that meant, sure. But went through the process. And I remember when I got the phone call from the lady, um, <laughs> her name was Barbara. And Barbara, Barbara was an interesting person because at that time, for you students, there were phones on the wall. There was not an answering machine. There was no <laughs> such thing as voicemail. So if you didn't answer the call, you missed the call. And I remember I was in between classes and the phone rang and I answered and it was, it was Barbara from CIA. And she said, Quintrell, this was my last time calling you. I've called you. And I'm like, Lord <laughs> Jesus. Um, but she said, I don't know why, but we usually don't offer internships to someone so late in their college career because we want to see you over several years. She said, but if this is what they say they want to do, I can't do anything about it. Thank you, Miss Barbara. Um, but I wish I would have done that earlier in my college career, but I, but I thank God for the opportunity. And so I was able to become a student intern for a year, graduated from Grambling. I was offered a graduate internship. So I went to graduate school, went to McNeese for my MBA, and worked for CIA, and that's the only place I've been in my adult career as far as college career CIA. So, but I definitely, so, so to you students, I would encourage you as, as freshmen, start now. Career services should be as frequent, you should be a frequent visitor to, to career services as you are to student union. Because employers are always coming through, and as you start perfecting on how to engage with employers, you're only gonna get better. And so, don't just stop, don't stop at one internship with one company. Take all the opportunities that are available to you. And so when you settle down on a career, whether you choose to stay with that company five or 10 years, you know what you're looking for. Because as we're talking to you, you should be talking to us and see if this is a place where you want to be engaged. I think this is a great time for this conversation. We do have the career fair tomorrow, so that's going to be great. Yeah. My next question is for Ms. Brooms. Looking back over your career and professional development process, what is one thing you wish you had done more of and one thing you wish you had done less of? So kind of just touching on what she mentioned, I wish that when I was at Grambling, I did go to the career services. It would have been a great opportunity and a great starting point, but I really didn't have that kind of guidance to say, go do this, go do that. Um, and so when I graduated from Grambling and I went back home, I had an ill grandmother at the time, I knew I had to get back in school. I was just working this regular job and I was like, this is not what I want. And so I knew then I had to go back. And I went back to graduate school and I went to school at Southern University in Baton Rouge. I'm from a small town in, in South Louisiana. And that was when I said, okay, I am going to utilize career services. I'm not just going to Southern's career fairs, I'm going to LSU as well. Because I know there are so many companies coming there that may not necessarily be coming to Southern. And so I did each one. For the two and a half years I was in grad school, I, they knew my face. They saw me every fall, every spring. And by the time I graduated, I had a full-time offer at Pricewaterhouse. And so that is what I wish I would have done more. Um, I don't know exactly what I would have done less. Um, I'll have to think on that one. But for sure, I know that is what I wish I would have done more. And I definitely, as you mentioned, encourage the students to get involved. Because once you're out of school, it gets so much harder. Because the, the um, employers aren't really looking for you as hard. When you're in school, they are coming. They are, we're here. And so we're here every semester because we want you to come and work for us. And when you get out of school, that competition is astronomical. 
that's also very important, networking, making connections, getting to know people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what character traits have been necessary during your career? Patience, <laughs> grace, understanding, um, just being, recognizing that in my, in my experience, just knowing that everything in my life has a season and it's gonna happen when it's supposed to happen. So I'm not gonna make manager this year if that's not what the plan is. Um, just knowing I'm gonna make mistakes. There are mistakes that are gonna happen. In public accounting, it is not a work-life balance. It is a work-life integration. There's really no such thing. Mm -hmm. You really have to figure out how to make the two work. And sometimes one is gonna sacrifice and get more time than the other. And trying to figure out how to balance that and being gracious to yourself because you're not gonna be perfect. But that, but learning those mistakes from those mistakes help you to grow into the person you're going to be. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Ms. Douglas. A 2020 Glassdoor survey found that only 46% of women negotiate their initial salary offer compared to 52% of men. The same study found that women who negotiate their salaries typically ask for 30% less than men. What advice would you give women on how to negotiate equitable salaries and benefits? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so funny because I am working on a, um, a process right now in um, basically on equity and compensation within the organization and internal promotions. Um, I would definitely tell women, know your value. Speak up for yourself, understand and know what you can do, and speak to it. Know your story, gain that experience, get that training, and um, speak to leadership. As I, I encourage, I encourage everyone, speak to leadership. Have those one-on-one, -on -one, see where See where someone that, um, where you want to go, know your goals, have a plan, and um, say, for instance, a VP. If that's where you want to be within five, seven, ten years, speak to a VP that, um, that, you, that inspires you. Speak to someone within uh, an organization or that you know and ask how they progress within their career but know your value, that's, that's key. And continuous development. You wanna definitely continue your development no matter what you do um, in life and um, seek those certifications and, and knowledge. Knowledge is key, definitely. And there you will, you will know what you deserve. <laughs> I always say look for the look for the salary ranges within um, they're they're available to you. Salary ranges are available to you, and look for the, seek for the highest. Go for that. Um, there's no there's no stopping you. Um, no one can say this is this is the limit if you have justification on why it's not. I love that you said know your value. Um, since I was younger, my platform was know who you are. And my mom always tells me know your value, know your worth, and know what you're bringing to the table. So I love that you said that. Yes, ma'am. My next question is for Mr. Magaro. Did you give new and soon to be professionals about navigating the workplace? You know, when we, uh, when we talk to employees uh, within the organization, <clears throat> we ask them to ensure two key things. One, to be sure that they are true to themselves, because if you're true to yourself, you're able to progress in a manner that you want, you desire, you express. But also, when you're pursuing other objectives, pursue them with the persistence that you want that particular objective to hold for you personally. So, so many times employees will back off of something because they see an obstacle and you have to, but it's just like in negotiations. Negotiation is, a, is about 
looking at an obstacle, but knowing enough to move through that obstacle into getting what you want. And in the whole time, making sure you're true to yourself. What advice would you give in handling controversy in the workplace? I'm sorry. Advice you would give in handling controversy in the workplace? You know, I, I, I think that's an obvious thing. Uh, there's uh, there's going to always be controversy when there's two people. Uh, so as humans, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I wish we could get past that. Uh, my wife's not here to attest to that, but I certainly <laughs> would suggest to you when... When controversies happen in the workplace, it's usually when one individual is trying to take precedence over somebody else. And I think it's coming together and saying, together we can satisfy a goal that satisfies both of us instead of trying to interact in a way that diminishes both of us. So the recommendation would always be try to find a solution between the two individuals and by doing so, you actually increase your own value. Thank you. I want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience, but I do have another question for everyone. If you could guest lecture a freshman and seniors for one day, what would your topic be and why? And we can start with you. Well, I think my topic would be, who is your who and whose who are you? I would pick that topic because I say that to say, who's your who? Because in this professional environment, you're going to need a who. You know, you need a support system. You're going to need those mentors, as he was mentioning, that are going to help you along the way. Um, and it's hard not having that. Because kind of going into public accounting and being kind of the minority, which you are, you know, who do I lean on? How do I know if this is the right move? What have you been through? And that person becomes your who. And as you continue to grow in your career and as you continue to, to progress, you become someone else's. So you look back and you pull people from behind you and help them to grow just like someone helped you. That's great. I love that. <laughs> um, if you could guest lecture freshmen, seniors for one day, what would your topic be and why? The topic probably would be on understanding your purpose. Because I think that oftentimes we are out of alignment with where we should be and what we should be doing because we don't understand our purpose. So once we understand our purpose, why are we here? Um, we can understand where we will add value. I always tell, I tell my mentees that our job is a means to an end, but God has a bigger purpose in us being where we are. And if we understand what our purpose are, not only can we fulfill the purpose of employment or what we owe to our employer, you render to Caesar what is Caesar, but also it help us to fulfill what God's plan is for our lives. So I think if we fully understand what our purpose is, why were we created, why were we here, I think we'll find better fulfillment. And with better fulfillment, we'll find that joy, peace, love. And I think that that will flow within the workplace and it'll give the workplace really good energy. And we will enjoy our day to day. Not saying that there won't be challenges um, or hiccups or conflict. That stuff will still exist. But we have our eye on the prize and what's our purpose. And that will help to stabilize everything. So when you are a Grambling alum, so when you graduated from Grambling and started working for the Central Intelligence Agency, do you think that's when you found your purpose? No. I would say I probably, it was maybe 15 to 20 years within my career I found my purpose. But it goes to show it's never too late. Um, but I think had I understood that earlier, a lot of my decisions may have been different. Probably would still, I, I believe I would still be at CIA. But one thing about CIA, the, the interesting thing about it is we change jobs every two to three years. So it's always retooling, learning something new. Like I said, I, I began my career in um, human resources and now leading an organization um, in open source intelligence. So the, look, the way I did that may have been different if I better understood my purpose. But it was a great learning experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything because it made me who I am today, and I'm good with that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I know at this age, a lot of students are worried about finding their purpose so soon, but I think it does take time, so. It does take time, and, we, and one thing she said, and I totally agree, we have to give ourselves grace. 
because we're, we're even, even at our age and, you know, I'll say I'm at the auntie age, right? And I'm, <laughs> I'm still growing, I'm still figuring out who Quinn is because the Quinn that was last year is different because we're growing, we're developing. But if we have the roots of purpose within us, that will never change. We'll just get better and blossom more. I love that. So you said your major was going to be psychology? Yes. Okay. I see why. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Great advice. I'm an armchair psychologist. <laughs> uh, Ms. Douglas, so if you could guest lecture at freshmen and seniors for one day, what would your topic be and why? I would say generational diversity. Um, generational diversity because this is the first time in which we have five generations within the workplace. Uh, everyone, you know, that knowledge transfer and understanding where each other belongs, what, what someone brings to the table, and um, finding yourself. Really getting, having those rap sessions with your, with your peers, your team, um, your, your group, your department, what have you, and just understanding what works, what doesn't, and, and getting to know what, you know, what you like within that, within that team. Um, being flexible, well-being, um, as we, we talk about mental health and so on within the workplace. Getting to know each other within the workplace is the best thing to do within, like I stated, your department, your team, your groups. Because once you know who you're working with and understand each other, then you can progress and be a better um, individual yourself as well as um, a team. You can really um, make your organization as a whole successful. and learn to grow together. So um, I, I'm really big, um, I'm an advocate on generational diversity and being able to find your seat at the table and speaking, being able to be open and speak about what you like, what fits, um, and how you fit within the organization or within your role. Yes, I love group projects and working with teams. I think it definitely prepares us for the future in the workplace. Um, last but certainly not least, if you could guest lecture at freshmen and seniors for one day, what would your topic be and why? Thank you. That was louder. I heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I apologize for my loss of hearing. Uh, too much in the 60s, too much loud music in the 60s. So... Uh, we get involved with uh, workforce development in San Antonio. There's a group that work with the school districts, work with the underserved communities, work with those that are marginalized, and the advice that we give is keep seeking your, your goal. But frankly, do more than that. Don't seek your goal for money. Don't seek your goal for what somebody else thinks it should be, but seek your goal in, right here. Because if you love what you do, the rest is easy, isn't it? So you've got to develop a passion for yourself, and that passion is going to drive your career. And when that career offers you challenges, make sure you understand your priorities in life. I had a very dear friend of mine who said, if you always recognize your priorities and go to your priorities first, then you're going to be fine. And his priorities were seek your faith, wherever that faith may be. Seek your family and those that you love the most because they will give you that sound advice to make sure that you are going to be able to proceed the way you love. And then pursue your own cadre of people, those that you collaborate with work, those that you associate with, those friends, those special people that actually are out for your betterment. So seek out your priorities once you know what you want, what you really love in life. Thank you. That's always been my mindset is to find my passion. And my mom always told me, like, the money will come. Find what you love and put your all into it.
Yes. Well, just like you and what you're doing. Look at that crown you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in communications. Yes, yes sir. What you love. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll take a few questions from the audience. Yes. What's, does your company, so the question is, does your companies have opportunities for international students? And if not, like, what is your company doing to like, actively recruit international students into its workforce? Mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll go first. Um, so we're an intelligence organization, a federal government organization, national security. And so it requires that you must be a United States citizen. But once you, if you choose to take that route, become a United States citizen, we, we usually tell people the day after you take the oath, apply for a uh, position with our organization. In our organization, we do R&D across the world. So there are certain organizations that perhaps even work for your organization within our company. That is required for a security clearance, requires a US citizenship. But other organizations, such as those that work in the automotive world, in a pharmaceutical world, those that work in the, in the world of space, all are an international community, can, can pursue a career. The interesting thing is trying to find a company that can assist you as an F1, as a J1, or actually as you continue to grow, as an H-1B or even into your, your green card. So if you're looking for those kinds of positions, seek out those companies that have those opportunities. Any other questions? I will say Intergy does, I have hired um, international students, international engineers. Um, as well as interns, so we do um, hire internationally. And Weaver does that as well. We do offer sponsorship for our international students. There are a lot of students in, um, and I'm from Dallas, I didn't mention that, so our offices are in Dallas, and there are a lot of students at schools there that are international. And so we're definitely open to that, and if the right student, then definitely we will respond to it. Thank you all so much. I have one last question. Any last words of advice you'd like to offer or a message you'd leave the students with? I'm just honored to be here. Being Grambling alumni, it is, it is actually been such a dream to be able to come back and finally recruit. Um, I've been at Weaver for 12 years and we have established what they kind of consider an expand the reach program. This program is allowing us to expand the reach outside of the schools that we typically recruit from. So in Texas, that's Texas Tech, that's the University of Houston, that's University of Texas in Dallas, because they offer the programs that um, our firm looks for. We're a CPA firm, so we want students that are gonna be able to sit for the CPA. They offer master programs. But that doesn't mean that it, I can't come here. And I have been asking for this and asking for this, and I'm so excited that our firm has expanded the opportunity and that we're expanding our reach and that I've got to come back and actually fulfill my dream here of recruiting from here. I would say something very similar. So as I said, my full-time job is deputy office director, but about seven years ago, um, I created this program called Strategic Outreach. And the intent was, I believe that our organization should look like the country that we serve. And it's about increasing diversity and going where the talent is. Um, and so I pitched the idea to my senior leadership at the time about us particularly looking at partnering with HBCUs and minority serving institutions. And so this has been a dream of mine. So when I talk about purpose and passion, you know, I have my day job, but this is what I do, which I would say, spend a lot of time on it because I'm very passionate about it. And so CIA came on campus when I was here at Grambling in the late 80s, early 90s. They were here several times a year. And so I made a commitment when I got into a position of authority and if I could do the same thing, I would do that. And so that's fulfilling that, that promise to myself of 
um, giving back to what was given to me. And so it was um, maybe three years ago, maybe 2019, President Gallo came up to, we hosted him at CIA and we had a luncheon and there was a gentleman there who was a CIA employee. Um, he led a similar program. And so we honored him at that lunch because a lot of the people around the table as Gramlin graduates, he personally recruited. And so when we start thinking about to our center of our career legacy, that's one of the things I wanna look at to make sure, I usually tell students when I'm on campus here, I'm looking for someone to replace me. And so we have to be able to reach back, spend time with the younger generation and so into their lives and make them ready for the future. Because I believe, again, our organization, Central Intelligence Agency, federal government organization, international organization, we definitely need to look like the country we serve. And so coming to, coming back to Grambling and being on campus with some of the brightest minds, it's just a dream come true to me. I mean, it, it makes my heart beat and I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, yeah, any last advice? I will piggyback off of both of you. Um, it is definitely an honor to be here. I, at the same time, um, I was excited about this opportunity and um, I kept stressing to come to Grambling and why weren't we recruiting from Grambling? As you stated, the brightest minds are here as an alumni um, from Grambling State University. I just wanted to be a part of this and wanted to ensure that we were recruiting um, from my, my alma mater. So being here is an honor and I do encourage you all to research, do um, go to the placement center, go to the career placement center. I remember working within the placement center and going to career fairs. We, one time I remember we had a bus that um, took us to Houston to a career fair. Uh, ask questions, stop by, ask who's coming, you know, what, um, what organizations, what companies, and interview. Even if it's something, an organization that you're not interested in um, working for, you never know what you find, but interview, practice, practice. Um, it makes you better, more successful in life, and as I stated, you never know what opportunities um, come about. Thank you. I, uh, I work for an organization that mantra is uh, we are going to pursue the solving of mankind's problems through innovative science and engineering. So one of the cornerstones of the organization is innovation. So how do you achieve innovation? You see, re you achieve that innovation by pulling together a group of people that are diverse have different thought, have different backgrounds, have different approaches to solving problems. And by doing so, we pull all of that thought together and come up with the innovative solutions that allow us to go to the moon, that allow us to go to the deepest parts of the ocean, that allow us to develop vaccines for Ebola, for COVID. But we have to do that and continue to grow a diverse workforce. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and giving us wonderful insight into career, the professional development process, and we really appreciated it. I think all I can say is wow. I might want to go back to college and redo this whole thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where the advice like that was when I was in college. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Those answers were everything we were looking for, right? Um, especially the one that said, and I quote, go back to career services. I love, did y'all see me clapping over there? Because this is the best advice, right? Come by the Center for Career and Professional Development. All of these things that they're talking about are all things that we can do for you. Especially that question, the answer that was salary ranges. Don't go out looking for jobs and not knowing what the salary range is. 
I can give you those. All you gotta do is come in the office and ask. Be armed when you go out into this world with the information you need to make you competitive and also so you can make informed decisions. So let's give our panel another hand. Also, what a moderator, right? What a moderator. She's great, we knew she would be great. We, we had no question and you were great. So thank you. Um, I don't know if they want me to do this, but I can't move on without recognizing my VP and my president, Mr. Logan. Dr. Gallo. I wouldn't have even had the courage to even think that we could pull something like this off without their support. It means everything to have the support of the people around you and the advancement team. These, this advancement team, I have no words. The teamwork, the support, just the willingness to work together is all there. And I'm not gonna talk to you to death because we got food across the hall. We got students who showed up when they could have been somewhere doing, uh, she's nodding her head. She was like, yes, ma'am, I could have been somewhere else. <laughs> but I love it because we ask for a commitment from our students. We ask for a commitment from these employers and we ask for a commitment from our students and we receive good things on both sides. So for me in my head, this is success. Anytime we can bring the two groups together, and we can have this type of conversation, that's success. So let's go across the hall, let's have conversation, let's get some of this good stuff that Sodexo has fixed for us, and let's finish this night off in a very powerful way, and I know I will see most of you here at eight in the morning for the breakfast, not the students. I know y'all will show up for that, right? The employers, but students, 11, 11 a.m., we're gonna get internships, we're gonna get jobs, and we're gonna form partnerships, and we're gonna get to know these employers, so when they come back in the spring, you'll be like, hey, Dr. Kehi, I saw you last semester, let's talk again. Those are the four things that we're working on. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.